truth of it. And I pray you might teach us your word this morning, Father. Help us to understand this pursuit of God that we're looking at is truly the endeavor that every believer ought to be involved in. Father, help us to recommit ourselves to it as we go through this study this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you notice what David says. David says, no matter where I go, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. If I go to heaven, you're there. And any place in between, that's where God is. There is no place in this vast, limitless creation that is around us where God is not. If you choose any ten points anywhere in God's creation, God is the same distance from all those points. God is everywhere at the same time. None of those points is any closer or farther from God than any of the others. So what that means is this. Everything must begin with God. He's got to be the starting point of it all. That's why the first book in your Bible says, in the beginning, God. Because that's where the beginning is. The beginning starts with God. He must be the starting point because He is the only thing on this earth that has no cause. Everything else does. So God was from the beginning. And with that understanding, look at Genesis chapter 3, if you would. Flip back a few pages. Genesis chapter 3. Understanding God is everywhere. Genesis chapter 3, and look at verse 8. Adam and Eve have sinned. Uh, they've take, partaken of the fruit, and they've followed through with what Satan called them to do. And so now in chapter 3 and verse 8, here's what happens. It says, They heard the voice of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They took the fruit, they realized they sinned, they're ashamed of their sin, and they attempt to do something that is impossible to do. They attempt to hide from the presence of God. And they can't do it. Uh, they put themselves among the trees and the bushes to try to remove themselves from God's presence. I just read you several verses from Psalm 139. David apparently had the same idea. He wondered if perhaps it was possible to hide from God's presence. He must have pondered that idea as he wrote that psalm. And he gave thought to that idea, and he writes some of the greatest verses in Scripture, and comes to the realization that no matter where he is, God is there. No matter where he is. Solomon stood at the dedication of the temple and said these words in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Solomon says, no matter where I am, a God is there. God contains the heavens. God embodies the heavens. Paul assures the, uh, the Athenians in Acts 17, 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happening they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Old Testament, New Testament, no matter who the writer, they understood that God is everywhere. So, we know that. We understand that. It's a basic truth of our faith. But being consciously aware of that, having that presence manifest to us at all times, are two different things. We can be aware of it and know it, but have it manifest to us is something very different. God is here and God is everywhere at all times, whether I acknowledge it or not. The only way to be aware of it is to surrender myself to Him, and allow Him to manifest Himself to me and through me as I surrender to Him. As I cooperate with Him, as I allow His Spirit to fill me and work through me, then I will see Him manifest Himself in what He does through me and around me, and then I'll be aware of His presence. But until I do that, I won't be aware of it. So to be truly aware of the presence of God at all times requires what the Christian life requires across the board, obedience and surrender. If I want to know feel the presence of God at all times, I must be obedient to Him, and I must surrender to His presence in my life. And the difference between those believers who do that and those who don't is the difference between the life of a believer who simply goes through the motions of the Christian life and a believer whose life shines with God's presence every day and in every situation. And I wonder what category you're in. Has your Christian life over the past week just been going through the motions, just doing what Christians do because that's what you're supposed to do? Or have you sensed God's presence in your life? Have you sensed God's presence working through you and around you as you've gone through your Christian life this week? I want to say something to you. God has no desire to hide himself from you. God is not playing some spiritual hide-and-seek game with any of us where he keeps himself in the darkness and forces us to try and find him. God is making himself aware of to, uh, to us all the time. God is seeking to reveal himself to us all the time. Go to the book of Exodus if you would. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, look at verse 4. Moses goes up to the mount again to get the tables because the first one had been broken. Exodus 34, verse 4, here's what happens. It says there, He hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him, had commanded him, and took his hand 
in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now I want you to see what happens here in verse 4. Uh, Moses obediently follows God's plan by recreating the tablets that God had to rewrite because the first ones were broken. And as Moses completes what God told him to do, he didn't have to cry out for God, didn't have to go seeking for God, didn't have to go on a full search of God. God came down on his own and willingly revealed himself to his faithful servant. Because Moses had been faithful in what he had done, surrendered to God in the activity, God then revealed himself to Moses without Moses having to seek him out at all. God wants to reveal his presence to you. God wants you to be fully aware of where he is. That is his utmost desire. And because he promised he would do that, he does that in a variety of ways. What it means is that this pursuit that we are on, this pursuit to know God, this pursuit of God, we can be a successful pursuit. God wants you to know Him. God wants you to see Him. God wants you to be aware of His presence. And therefore, as we pursue Him, God will allow us to meet Him and be aware of Him. Uh, draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you, James 4.8. Draw nigh to God in surrender, in obedience, and God will draw nigh to you. He is wanting a full relationship with you. And He will grant that relationship to you as we draw nigh to Him. And you understand, just to make it clear, when we talk about drawing nigh to God, we're not talking about getting closer to Him like I get closer to the pulpit as I walk closer to it. We're talking about getting closer to God in relationship. It's like if you spend a lot of time with your husband or your wife or your kids, and as you spend that time, you feel relationally closer to them as a result of that time. Same thing we're talking about here. As you draw close to God, as you spend time with Him, you're aware of His presence, and you feel a closer relationship to Him. God wants to have a close relationship with His children. So let me ask you this. With all that known, with all that understood, why is it that some people find God and some people don't? Why is it that some people live their entire lives never having that close relationship with Him and some seem to be connected with Him in ways that we can only dream about? Why does it seem that God reveals Himself to some in fuller ways than He does to others? I mean, we know God doesn't play favorites. God is no respecter of persons. God is not like some better than others, and so he reveals himself to some in ways that he doesn't reveal himself to others. We know that's not the case. So what is the difference? Why does God reveal himself to some more than others? Well, here's something we do know. The difference does not lie with God. It's not, that difference does not lie with God. The difference lies with us. It's not a certain personality type or a certain character type that God chooses to reveal himself to. If you study the saints down through the ages, you're going to find those who truly were used by God and truly knew God, you'll find vast differences in those personalities. Uh, Moses was very different from Jeremiah. Uh, Billy Sunday was very different from D.L. Moody. On and on we could go. Uh, there were differences in their personal qualities, differences in their character, but had, that had no effect whatsoever on how God revealed himself to them. But I think they all had one quality. All those who truly had a connection to God had that bond, that close relationship with Him. I believe they all possess a quality that we might call spiritual receptiveness. Spiritual receptiveness. I think all the old saints that did great works for God and who were unfailingly faithful to Him had an openness to hearing and knowing God. They lived their lives, eyes and ears wide open, waiting to see Him, waiting to hear from Him, waiting to experience Him. They had an openness to him, consciously and consistently aware of his presence. They had a spiritual awareness that affected everything else that they did. All around them, always aware, spiritually, that God was working. And they nurtured that awareness, and they enhanced that awareness, because it became the only thing that mattered in their lives. All that mattered to those old saints was knowing him, pursuing him, drawing closer to him. That's all they cared about. And the difference between them and many of us is that when they felt drawn to God, when they became aware of His presence, they didn't ignore it. They didn't move on to their own plans or get focused on their own circumstances and just move away from that awareness. They nurtured it. They went after it. They enhanced it. They went after it full-hearted because that's what they wanted in their lives. They acquired the lifelong habit of responding to the spiritual awareness that they felt. David expressed it clearly as any man could in Psalm 27 verse 8. Here's what David said. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Now, folks, there it is. God says, Seek ye my face. And David said, When I heard those words, I responded by saying, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. I go after it. And that is probably the most simple way to say it. 
and yet it captures the attitude that made those who were consistently aware of God's presence, why they were so aware of it, why they were so aware of the presence of God around them. God made Himself available. God offered to be known by them, and they simply made the effort to see Him. That's what David says, Lord, I'll seek your face because you've allowed me to seek your face. And we may try to complicate this thing, but it is as simple as seeking God's face because He has made Himself available to us. God's here. God's here. God's all around you. God seeks you to know Him. God is seeking a relationship with you, a closeness with you, beyond anything we can imagine. We try to complicate it, but the Lord wants to have it. And when we speak of this spiritual receptiveness, we must first understand that this ability to perceive God's presence is a gift given to every believer. None of you have been left out. God has given that gift to all of you. All of you have within you the seeds of that spiritual receptiveness, that awareness of God and the awareness of God's presence around you. At salvation, God placed His Spirit inside you. And when He did that, when He placed that Spirit inside you, He gave you a spiritual awareness that you never had before. He livened that Spirit. He quickened that Spirit. That Spirit came alive. The Holy Spirit came inside you. And now you can be spiritually aware of whatever God is doing around you. So no believer can say that he was not given the ability to know God as deeply as he desires to know Him. Now what we do with that ability, how we choose to use it, how we exercise it and develop it, how much we make use of it, that's your choice. That's my choice. We can decide to let it, let it go, set it aside, or we can decide to pursue it the way God wants us to pursue it. And the more I recognize it, the more I cultivate it, the more I put it to use, that's going to determine the extent to which I am aware of God's working in me and around me. So, to fully benefit from God's, the awareness of God, to fully benefit from God's presence around me, to fully benefit from the knowledge of the presence of God is connected to a four-letter word. And for some believers, this four-letter word is as bad as any other four-letter <laughs> word I can give you this morning. But here's the four-letter word. Work. <laughs> work. If I'm going to be aware of God's presence, it's going to take work on my part. Now, you don't work for your salvation. You understand that. That's a free gift. But to know God intimately, to have the closest God desires, that's going to take an ability to exercise and sense God's presence in my life. I need to exercise that awareness. I need to work with that awareness and make it applicable to my life in every situation. Again, I believe the old saints were aware of that. I think they knew about this need for them to work to gain all that God had to offer. Again, you're in Exodus chapter 34. Moses climbed a hill, climbed a mountain, and took tables up there and made those tables for God so he could write the Ten Commandments on them. The whole idea was, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to surrender to your plan. Whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. That was work. That was work. But in the process of that work, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. Now look at that. God ascended from the cloud and stood with Moses. An amazing concept. Here is God, the Almighty, standing with his servant Moses. Why? Because Moses worked to be obedient to what God <coughs> called him to do. You see, folks, as generations have progressed, I think we have less and less a desire to know him the way God wants us to know him. I think we live in an age where everything comes fast, everything comes easy. We live in an age where you push a button and you get exactly what you want in less than a second. You have exactly what you're looking for with no time spent at all. And we have taken that mindset and applied it to our relationship with God. We want what we want now. We don't want to wait for it. I don't want to put a lot of effort, a lot of energy into it. I want it now. That whole concept of easy, easy believism, all i got to do is just certain things and God reveals himself totally to me, that might sound good. That's not Bible. That's not Bible. Uh, salvation comes free and easy. But after that, the Christian life is a life of work. It's a life of labor. We looked at that in our study in 1 Corinthians. So you see, I read my chapter a day. I send up my quick prayer to, at a meal. I put in a couple hours at church on Sunday. I've done all I need to do to know God. I should have a full awareness of Him just by doing those things. And if I really want to stretch myself, I may go to church on Thursday, or I might read an extra chapter sometime during the week, and that should be enough. God should be satisfied with that, and God should fully reveal Himself to me as a result of that. Or I listen to Christian radio, or I watch a preacher on TV. I hear of their spiritual adventures, how God is working in their lives, and I use that as my spiritual foundation. It may not be happening to me, but God's working somewhere, and I'll just use that as my experience. He isn't noticeably working in my life or anywhere around me, but I hinge myself to somebody else's experience, and I'll use that as my experience. I'll never experience it personally myself. 
because it won't work for them. And the results we see are what we see all around us. And what we see in the lives of those we know, in our lives as well, we see believers with no spiritual depth whatsoever. We see believers who have a foundation of rock and sand that can be moved by the slightest wind. We see believers who buy into the latest Christian fad, the latest Christian book that proclaim things never found in God's Word. There's a book right now out there, I don't know the title of it exactly, but something about nine minutes in heaven or something, something crazy like that. They're going to make a movie out of it. Find that in the Word of God for me. Christians are being sucked up by that stuff. Find it in the book. Find it in the book. But you see, because we have no spiritual depth, we latch on to that stuff, and we'll use that as our experience. God's working in His life. God did a great thing in His life, so God must be working. Not that I know it myself, but He's working in somebody else's life. That's my evidence. Believers come to church to have fun. Believers come to church to be entertained. Believers come to church for the food and the fellowship. That's why they come to church. We have believers who will mistake a dynamic personality and a smooth delivery for the power of God. And it's not the same thing. And we see believers who equate big numbers with God's blessings. If there's a lot of people, God must be blessing that place. I've been in places where there have been a lot, of a lot of numbers, and it's been dead. It's been dead. That's not how God works. That's not how God operates. But if He's not working in my life, if I have no spiritual awareness personally, I've got to find some evidence that He's working. So I'll latch on to anything I can latch on to and make that my evidence that God's working. All of those things are an indication of spiritual illness. Serious sickness spiritually, a sickness of the soul, and we must all take some responsibility if the, in the developments that have occurred. We all must take certain responsibility for that. We have allowed those things to continue. We've allowed those things to progress, and we've spoken few words against any of them. We've allowed the spiritual temperature of others, the experience of others, to define our own. And you see, folks, if I've got a boiling pot of hot water, if I put a few ice cubes in there, it's going to cool that water down. <laughs> and I can allow myself to be heated up spiritually, but if I surround myself with mellow, lukewarm Christians, it's going to cool me down. It's going to make me less involved and less intensive in my relationship with Jesus Christ. What I have done, oftentimes, is allow my thoughts and my experiences to shape God's Word instead of allowing God's Word to define and shape my experience. Now get that. Get that. That's a plague of the church. That's a plague in Christianity today. We allow our thoughts and our experiences to shape God's Word instead of allowing God's Word to shape and define my experiences. And we have many, many believers across this nation this morning who are in churches that are foundational on experience. What they believe, they believe because of the experience they've had. Whether it matches what the Word of God says or not, it makes no difference. It's been my experience, and therefore it's got to be true. God's Word must define your experience. And if you can't find biblical base for your experience on the Word of God, there's something wrong with the experience. Something wrong with it. Truth now conforms to us instead of us conforming ourselves to truth. And if we want to change that, it means going against the flow of Christian thought that's all around us. It's going to require a determination and a steadfastness to pull myself away from prevailing Christian thought, prevailing Christian way of doing things, and return myself to God's prescribed way of living the Christian life, the way He defines it in His Word. And it can be a large and seemingly overwhelming task, but it can be done. All it takes is believers who are willing to work, to do the work that God has called us to do. Every age has had men and women who have been willing to stand against the religious system of the day and stand for truth. Every age has had it. And although we may not see ourselves in the same league as Martin Luther or Jonathan Edwards or many of those great old reformers, it does not mean that God cannot use us in the same way that He used them. Because all God is seeking are men and women who will simply seek His face and live in His presence. That's all God wants. All God wants. Just seek His face moment by moment and live in the presence of God. He is simply seeking those who will put themselves in the way and allow Him to lead in their life wherever that takes them. And it doesn't take some strong personality or some enormously, enormously gifted person to do that. It just takes a believer who is willing to surrender themselves to Him. It will just take a believer or a group of individuals who will turn to God in earnest, who will exercise themselves to godliness, and will seek to allow God to develop their spiritual receptiveness through faith and through trust and through obedience and through humility. That's what it takes. And if we will do that, the results will go beyond anything we've ever imagined, ever dreamed of, ever hoped for. It will go beyond what we ever thought God could do with us and through us. Any individual, anybody in this room who will repent of their self-centeredness, who will sincerely seek to return to God and seek Him and Him only, will be amazed at what God could do. Yeah, amazed at what God could do. 
Any individual who will break out of the trappings of the Christian thinking of the culture of the day, who will return to God's Word and allow that book to define how they think and how they act and how they respond, who will allow that book to define their standards for everything they do, will be delighted and overwhelmed with how God will respond to that. Respond to that. God will respond. And I will say it to you again, the universal presence of God is a fact. God is here, and God exists everywhere at one time. The entire universe is alive with Him. As far as you might go in that universe, God is there. He's already been there. And let me say this as well. I'm not talking to you about some strange God. I'm not talking to you about some God manufactured by man. I'm talking about the God you know. I'm talking about the God that died upon the cross for your sins. I'm talking about the God who sent His Son to this earth to die for you. That God who hung upon that cross and paid that price for you and for me. That's the God I'm referring to. That's the God you can know. And this God from the very moment of creation has sought to get our attention. From the very moment He made us, His entire endeavor has to get us to seek Him and to get attention from Him. He has sought to reveal Himself to us, has sought to communicate with us. And I think it seems like it should be the opposite. It should seem more like I should be trying to get his attention. I should be trying to seek after him. But no, God started the process. God is seeking to reveal himself to us. He has sought to communicate with us. And that's what he offers this morning. He has placed inside every believer in this room the ability to know him, to live in his presence constantly, constantly aware that he is here all around us. And all I've got to do is gain that knowledge that he offers to me. And that's what pursuing God is all about. That's what we're doing the study here in Sunday school at 9.30. The goal of our pursuit is to live in the presence of God, to live ever aware that God is here and that God is all around us and that God is revealing himself to us. And the more spiritually receptive I am, the more I develop that exercise, that ability, the more I will know him. My knowledge of him will increase as my receptiveness to him increases. And when I do that, everything changes. The impact upon my life is going from night to day. Being aware of His presence daily in my life means that I become less aware of everything else. It all fades into the background as I become fully aware of Him. Everything begins to fade. My per perspective entirely changes as I become aware of God's presence. Now, I want to show you an example of that this morning. Turn to Psalm 73, if you would. I want to show you what happens to a man who truly changes his perspective and becomes aware of the presence of God. Psalm 73. And in his own words, we're going to hear what this man says this morning. We're going to see the journey he went through as he journeyed away from God and journeyed back to God. And I realize chapter, uh, Psalm 73 is a very familiar psalm to most of you. I'm sure you've read these words many, many times, but I want you to read them this morning in light of the fact that God is present, that God is here, that God is real, and that God wants to make himself real to you. I want you to notice the first 12 words of this psalm of Asaph. Asaph says this, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such that are, as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than, than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return th hither, and waters of a full cup are run out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Asaph is looking around him. He's looking at the wickedness around him, and he sees what the wicked are doing. And what he sees is, they have no regard for anything or anybody else but themselves. He sees them as prideful and corrupt and ungodly. He sees them as glorifying themselves and gaining from the approach that they take. Look at verse 13. He says, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He said, look at all these folks around me, all these ungodly folks, and look how well they're doing in their pride, in their arrogance, in their self-centeredness. They are going along in life like there's no problem whatsoever. And then he says, here am I. I've cleansed my heart. I've washed my hands, but I've done it in vain. There's no reason for me to do it because I'm plagued all the day long and I'm chastened every morning. What I've done 
Asaph says, has not gotten me anywhere. Those who live wickedly don't seem to suffer at all, and here I am suffering. And I want you to notice what he accuses the wicked of. Go back to verse 11. Verse 11 says, And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? He says, These lost people, these wicked people, have no idea that God is around them. They have no idea of any knowledge of God whatsoever. Uh, he accuses them of thinking that God is nowhere around, that God can't see what's going on, that God has no idea what's happening. In other words, he accuses them of having no understanding of the presence of God. They have no understanding at all of God's universal presence. And I will stop here and say this, he's right about that. He's exactly right. Uh, the wicked have no idea of God's presence. They have no idea that God is everywhere. Uh, they may have some intellectual knowledge of the presence of God in some way or another. They may have been raised to believe that God is everywhere through some religious training they went through. But practically speaking, the wicked do not embrace the idea of God's universal presence. Because if the lost people for a moment really thought that God was everywhere, they wouldn't do some of the things they do. <laughs> They wouldn't involve themselves in some of the things they involve themselves in. They wouldn't say some of the things they say or wouldn't think some of the things they think. Lost people stay lost because they don't believe God knows what they're doing. They believe God is light years away and has no knowledge at all of what any individual does on this tiny planet. What they believe, if God does exist, he has no impact on their life whatsoever. That's what keeps them lost. But more important to our study is what's happening here with Asaph. Asaph has his sight set on the circumstances around him. His vision is clouded by what's happening to him on earth, what's happening to the wicked who live with him. His eyes and his vision are completely consumed by earthly events and earthly people. And you can see the result. Look at verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Asaph says, I look around, I watch what's going on, I look at my life, what I've tried to do, look at their lives and what they're doing, and what it does, it puts me in pain. Emotional pain, spiritual pain, that's where Asaph is. No joy in his life. He is not living above the circumstances. Asaph is being drowned by the circumstances. What's the cure? How can Asaph pull himself out of the situation he's in? How can he get his eyes off the circumstances that are ready to <coughs> overrun him and overwhelm him completely? Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. There it is. Until I went into the place where God was, or if I could put it in our context, until I came to grips with the presence of God. When I became aware of God's universal presence, it changed my perspective. You see, what Asaph is accusing the wicked of in verse 11 is the same place Asaph was as a believer. Just as they had no knowledge of God's presence, so also Asaph had no knowledge of the presence of God. And just as it affected the behavior of lost people, so also it affected Asaph's behavior as well. And the reason he had his eyes on the circumstances was because he lost the truth of the presence of God. And the circumstances, as a result, were eating him alive. He lost the idea that because God was there, he knew exactly what was going on. God saw exactly what was happening. God had not missed a thing that was happening on this earth. God was aware of every detail, but Asaph missed that. He got his eyes off that until verse 17. He goes where God is. He walks into God's sanctuary and realizes God is here. God is aware. God knows all that's going on around him. And then, when he got that perspective, it made no difference at all what was going on around him at that point. The circumstances cleared away. It no longer mattered to him what those people did. Look at verse 21. After he walks into the sanctuary, in verse 17, Thus my heart was grieved, I was pricked in my reins. So foolish, so foolish was I, and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by my right hand. Notice he says there, before I got this awareness, before I realized again the presence of God, I was like an animal. Animals don't live with any kind of knowledge of God's presence. But he said, that's what I was. I was like a beast before thee. And then I came into the contact with you. I realized your presence. I realized, verse 23, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. 
whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart, and my portion forever. For lo, they that are, that are far from thee shall perish, thou hast destroyed all of them that go whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God, that I might declare all thy works. There it is, folks. Spiritual receptiveness. <laughs> he swung his vision back to God's presence, and in doing that, you see the change in him from verses 1 through 12 to the verses 21 through 28, an entire change of perspective, an entire change in life altogether. And he determines he will never lose track of God's presence again. He confirms in his mind that all he needs is the presence of God, all he needs is nearness to the Father, and everything else is nothing but distraction. Nothing, to, nothing but that, those things that take his mind off who God is. And I love the final testimony in verse 28. It is good for me to draw near to God. That's why we made the focus of our Sunday school hour, pursuing God. Because if we learn that lesson, if we conform to that thought, that it's good to draw near to God, then everything else is handled, folks, and nothing else matters. It's all handled and settled by that one thought. So I ask you this morning, have you learned that it's good to draw near to God? Have you learned that? Is that your testimony this morning? Have you learned that it, it is good to have a cons constant and consistent awareness of God's presence? If you have learned that, if that's where you're at this morning, then you know exactly what Paul was talking about when he talked about a peace that passeth all understanding. Having an awareness of God's presence consistently and constantly gives you peace like Asaph speaks of here. I don't care what's going on now. My flesh, my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. No matter what happens to me personally, Asaph says, God is my strength. I am living in the presence of God. I'll say it to you one more time. God is here this morning. God's in this place. And as you walk out of this place, God goes with you. Wherever you go this week, God is there right beside you, always around you, always present with you. And what he says is this, draw near, draw close, seek me, be obedient to me, surrender to me, and I will draw near to you. It's the main reason God provided his salvation to you. That's why God saved you and left you here. Because God wants to manifest his presence to you while you're here on this earth. So make the realization you need to make, folks. Make the realization that it is good for me to draw near to God. God is present. God is real. Do whatever work you need to do to live in the daily presence of God. Father, thank you for this truth this morning. Thank you, Father, for the word.